Greetings, readers. I'm Audrey Chapuis, the director of the American Library in Paris. Welcome to Evenings with an Author, sponsored by Grow at Annenberg. Tonight, we have author Lisa C. in conversation with Pauline Le Masson. As many of you know, the American Library has been central to literary life in Paris for the last 100 years, acting as a lending library, but also as a community anchor for readers, writers, and everyone interested in the world of ideas. We are a completely independent nonprofit institution, and it is thanks to the generosity of our community that we continue to thrive. So we are in the midst of our spring appeal, one of our twice yearly calls for funds to help sustain the library. And donations of any amount are welcome and help keep programs just like this uh, alive and well. And your donations are tax deductible in France and the US. So I thank you um, so much for considering making a gift tonight. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the library's new programs manager, Alice McCrum. Alice has been busy behind the scenes and she's joining us live for the first time in the Zoom room. So now over to Alice to introduce tonight's exciting speakers. Thank you, Audrey. I am totally thrilled to be hosting um, tonight's conversation. As Audrey mentioned, we will be hearing tonight from Pauline Le Masson and Lisa Thuy. So first, Pauline who received her PhD in Social Sciences and Comparative Education from UCLA. Pauline also covers culture, history, and current affairs for Inspirel and Untapped Paris. She was formerly the Strategic Partnerships Manager at the American Library in Paris and the Executive Director of the Chinese American Museum in LA. Pauline will be in conversation with Lisa C who started her career in LA at Publishers Weekly, and who is also the New York Times best-selling author of 12 novels, including most recently, Shanghai Girls, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, and The Island of Sea Women. These three novels will be the focus of tonight's conversation. Honored as the National Woman of the Year by the Organization of Chinese American Women in 2001, C also received the Golden Spike Award from the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California in 2017. Tonight's conversation will address writing, creativity, female friendship, and research. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lisa and Pauline. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everyone. Hi, Pauline. It's so good to see you. Yes, it is so great to see you as well. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from sunny Los Angeles. Um, it's morning for you, isn't it? So, yes, it is. Yes. So uh, we're about finishing our day here. Um, you remind us actually that you have a connection to the American Library in Paris. You spoke as an evenings with an author um, back in 2010. And I have to, we, we can both give a shout out uh, to Charlie Trueheart, I guess. Yes. Ex- uh, 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 director of the American Library in Paris. Uh, Lisa, I don't know if you remember, but you were the one who told me when I told you I was going to Paris, uh, this is back in 2010, leaving Los Angeles, you said, you must absolutely look up Charlie Trueheart at the American Library in Paris. Uh, and I did, uh, and then volunteered and I went to subsequently work there. So it's a belated thank you, Lisa, to you for kind of establishing my, my time here in Paris. Um, I wanted to actually get started, Lisa, with um, a question about your process um, as a writer. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning author of Viet Thanh Nguyen, the author of The Sympathizer, said that for him, writing is a lot of looking out at windows. Um, and so I wanted to get your thoughts, um, how that is for you. And as well, uh, we all kind of live through this extremely difficult year in 2020 and whether any of that changed the way that you took to writing or to reading or any of the creative process that you would do um, if you want to speak towards that. Well, uh, Viet, he's, you know, such an amazing person and such an amazing writer. I, I like that he stares outside. I actually sort of stare into the middle distance. I don't know. I just like, I, I, I somehow can tune out the rest of the world. And I think it's a lot of, for me, about just really imagining, you know, what if, that's always, well, here's a situation, now what if, what would I do? 
And uh, I think that's how I sort of get into character and get into the time is just, um, again, just sort of imagining and whether you're looking outside or again, that sort of nowhere, I, th I think you're getting to the same place. This year, oh man, I mean, it's been hard. I, I you know, know it was very tough in, in France for a while, but we had a terrible winter here. And um, so, so many lives lost, you know, in Los Angeles County, it's one out of 400 people died. And, and it's just, it, it was just overwhelming for a while. I, I don't know, it, you know, I don't think it's had played much of a, a role in my writing or how I look at stuff when I'm, when I'm doing research, mm -hmm. but what it has done is it's made it very difficult for me to think, it had made it difficult for me to think about the next book. And so I, I do think about books for a very long time before I decide this is the one that I'm gonna be working on. And, um, you know, some books, 10, 20 years that I think about before I decide this is the one. So I had thought I knew what the next one was going to be. And I've been collecting material for about four years um, it was something I'd learned about maybe 10 years ago, but I'd been collecting material, but it was going to require a pretty tough trip deep, deep, deep into a very remote area of China. And there's just no way I could have done that last year, no way to do it this year. And I don't know, I'm a bit dubious about even next year with all the variants out there. So that just was off the table. And do you want to hear how I how I came up with the next book? Just I can do it really fast. Yeah. So I I was, you know, spending a lot of time in the house and here are all my research books behind me. And I just one day out of the corner of my eye, a spine just, you know, just kind of caught my eye, gray, nothing exciting, nothing to pop, but I pulled it out, reproducing women. Um, pregnancy and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm in a pandemic. I'm not going anywhere. This book has been on my shelves for 20 years. I'll read it. And I got to page 19 and there was a mention of a woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty. Now that, that's not that extraordinary. China has a history of, of female physicians going back 2000 years, but she was the first woman. And in fact, the first man or woman to write a book of her cases, which was published in 1510. And I actually have it on the floor over there. It's, it's published in English. Many of her formulas are still used today, but she was a bound footed woman, a very wealthy woman um, who treated not only the women in the compound where she lived, but somehow managed to get out into the world and treat uh, women um, you know, boat women and servants and things like that. So uh, I'm having a lot of fun with her and I'm hoping at some point I will be able to travel to the town where she was from. But the good thing about having it, you know, in the late 1400s, early 1500s is there's no one alive today who knew her, you know, no one for me to interview. So pretty much everything has to come out of books or the internet or journals. I've, I have a whole series of interviews set up on Zoom with scholars around the country and around the world who can help me with certain things like, you know, how did an elite woman, bound footed, very wealthy woman in those days actually get out? How was she allowed to travel? Um, just practical things like that. So there are people out there who know the answers to that and and I'm slowly finding them and talking to them. So even cool. though you're just in a room and yeah. the world is shut off from me, I think you can still um, through, through Zoom, but through other ways, actually reach out and find people who can help you or help me anyway. Well, that next book project of yours, Lisa, sounds um, extraordinary. Um, you know, we're all gonna be looking forward to when that comes out. Um, you mentioned Shanghai Girls, um, and you had mentioned before, I think in other interviews, that Shanghai Girls is your most autobiographical work of fiction. Um, and you know, part of the fun, Lisa, for, for preparing for tonight was to pull down all of your books. So here they are. <laughs> and, um, so it's, 
You Say Shy High Girls is your most autobiographical work of fiction. On Gold Mountain, which is your work of nonfiction, the memoir of your great great grandfather um, and his kind of 100 year kind of odyssey that spans your Chinese American family. And it's interesting because On Gold Mountain reads like a work of fiction. It's so fantastical and so sweeping that you just can't hardly believe everything is real. Um, and then Shanghai Girls is so well researched. You're so steeped in the Shanghai of 1930s and then all through that time where they spent also in uh, Los Angeles Chinatown reads like a work of nonfiction. So I wanted to know actually, um, where did that inspiration come from to write Shanghai Girls? Did you know that it was going to be kind of autobiographical and is there any particular- well, Chris, I do want to say, I don't think of it as necessarily being autobiographical, well, but there were, I would say two things that I really drew from that come from the family and my own experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to go back to like how this idea came up. I had um, been out on the road like three months a year promoting books, so, you know, first the hardcover, then the paperback, then the hardcover, then the paperback every year, plus doing research. And I, I have to say, I was just exhausted. And my husband and I had been up in the Bay Area for something and we were driving down, you know, Highway 5. It's a, as you know, Pauline, it's a really ugly drive, but it's fast. And I was just, again just exhausted and and my and I had an idea of what I thought I was going to do again it was going to require one of these really difficult trips um, to China mm -hmm. and you know it's one thing going to a place like Shanghai and it's another to go to a place where they may have electricity for an hour a day or you know no running water I mean it's just it's do I look like a camper? No, I mean, I'm, you know, so it's, you know, somebody else might be better at that, but I, I'm kind of a baby about all that stuff. And it takes a lot out of me, I think. And, and then just that kind of grueling on the road stuff that I've been doing. And so my husband said, you know, why don't you try to think of something that you could do that's closer to home? And, um, and then the other was he, the other question was, what's the relationship you want to write about? You've been writing about mothers and daughters. You've been writing about best, you know, friendship. And he said, you know, you've never written about sisters. Right. And I, I actually have always thought of myself as an only child. I am the only child of my mother and father. But in fact, I have a half sister that's my mother's daughter, a half sister who's my father's daughter, and a former stepsister who had her birthday yesterday. We've now known each other for 62 years. So either I'm an only child or I'm one of four sisters. And it was just like this light bulb kind of going off. Like, oh, I really know a lot about sisters. Mm -hmm. And so that became very clear. And then again, that idea of how could I do a story where I wouldn't have to leave home. I mean, my poor husband, you know, um, I, I think he just wanted to see me more, you know, <laughs> so he was trying to find, help me find a story where I wouldn't be gone for a huge amount of time. Mm -hmm. And so that made me start thinking about Los Angeles Chinatown again. And very specifically, and, and you would know this, Pauline, this um, area called China City. And so China City was uh, this one square block surrounded by a miniature Great Wall. And inside it was built from the leftover sets from the filming of The Good Earth, but also other films as well. So it was this totally kind of made up Hollywood goofy tourist attraction. Right. And it, it was only open for 10 years. There were two fires. The second fire, that was it, it closed completely, but there were just a couple of buildings left over. And one of them was where my family had our, our Chinese antique store for about 30 years after China City closed. Right. And this was this you know big, big kind of warehouse looking building on the outside, but inside it had a, a central road. And then mm -hmm. on the sides were all these little rooms with Chinese architectural elements, you know, upturned beads and things like that, right. that um, had once been the shops in China City. So now, in, you know, where, where I was as a child, 
This was uh, the bronze room, the art room, um, ceramics, textiles, jewelry, you know, and it just, it, all these little rooms. But there were also these other kind of nooks and crannies where uh, you had the old China City goldfish pond, the old China City wishing well. So I thought of it as kind of like the skeleton of China City. Well, by the time my husband was saying to me, you know, can you find something in LA to write about? China City, that building had been demolished. It was wiped off the earth. And I really wanted to try to find people who had maybe owned shops and restaurants, cafes in China City, or had been children in China City, you know, mm -hmm. whose parents had, had, had worked there. And it was such an incredible stepping stone for immigrants who, mm -hmm. you know, to actually have a place to work, to have a place where they could get a start, a lot like Alvera Street, you know, as you know. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted to try to find those people before they were gone. So right. to me, while I don't think of that book as being terribly autobiographical, it was this way for me to kind of capture um, the, the, this place that had meant so much to me as a child, mm -hmm. but also to grab those stories before they just disappeared. Right. And, you know, there's the Shanghai Girls and matches in the timeline for certain parts of On Gold Mountain as well, too. So right. <clears throat> exactly. Because yeah. my my great grandfather's brother, so that would be like my great great uncle, I guess, he had a store in, in China City and he became whatever, you know, like the president of the China City Business Association. And so all of his children had grown up in China City and they had these incredible memories mm -hmm. um, of what that was like. So, uh, you know, there was a true family connection, but also this sense of this, this skeletal building that had meant so much to me as a child. Right. Lisa, your books are so well loved for, you know, so many different reasons. I think readers can come to expect certain things when they pick up uh, one of your books. And um, I don't like to use the word uh, like a successful formula because formula evokes predictability and there's nothing predictable about any of your books. Um, but I think that readers can be assured that the writing is gonna flow beautifully. The history is going to be very immersive. And in the central focus, many of your characters are gonna be these relationships that women have. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've written about mothers and daughters, sisters, um, long lifelong friends, kind of like a sister part, sister part soulmate. And I have, you know, heard so many people tell me that you have written exactly how my mom and I interact. Um, my sisters are just like that. Um, and that could be, you're talking about, you know, sisters, um, you know, in 1930s Shanghai, or it could be, the lifelong friends and Snowflower and Secret Fan is 19th century China. So, but you somehow evoke, I think, the feelings um, that women share when they have these bonds. Um, and I'm wondering actually, what is it about these relationships? Because it seems like you say you're an only child, but then you also have this sweeping family um, of sisters and half sisters. Um, what is it that draws you to write about uh, these uh, relationships? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, I am a woman. Um, I do write about women. I can't see everybody who's watching, but I bet a lot of the people there are women. 80% uh, of all books are bought by women. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I this isn't a commercial decision that I make, but it really comes from being a woman. But there is something else that I have thought about a lot over the years, which is um, if you sort of look at the whole, you know, Western canon of literature. When you go back in the past, there weren't a whole lot of women who were writing and get, get being published or that we even remember today. I mean, there's Jane Austen, there's the Bronte sisters, there's Emily Dickinson, there's George Sand, but you know, they're very few and far between. And it's really not until you get to Virginia Woolf, so around a hundred years ago, that um, women start to be published more consistently, read more consistently, and they were not in every case, but often writing about women in a way that men had not written about women. You know, I, I sometimes say, well, how would Anna Karenina have been different if it had been written by a woman? 
So you have this whole body of, of literature uh, where there are stories about women, but they were written by men. And so I, I do think women probably have a different perspective on um, their relationships, on their emotions than men have in their heads about how, about women's relationships and emotions. And then mm -hmm. just very sort of specifically, you know, writing about mothers and daughters, uh, and this has, you know, could be mothers and sons, I am the mother of sons. Right. Um, this is a unique relationship we have in our lives. I mean, every single person on earth, somewhere along the line, had a mother. And maybe you knew her, and maybe you didn't, and maybe she was nice, and maybe she wasn't. But we all had one, you know, so th this is a universal. And then um, with friendship, I, I, don't know, I, I, I think about this a lot because this is a unique relationship that women have. Um, it's a very particular kind of intimacy. You will tell a friend something that you wouldn't tell your mother, your boyfriend, your lover, your husband, your children. So it's, it's this, again, a very particular kind of intimacy. And, and when you have that, you know, you're, you're, you really are opening yourself up. You're opening yourself up and you're vulnerable. And anytime you're vulnerable like that, anytime you're open like that, you're also open to being hurt or betrayed. And so to me, uh, again, it's just unique. It's a unique relationship that we have in our lives that's unlike any other. Right. Um, I think that is, you know, definitely the feeling that um, a lot of the readers get is that all of the emotions that are evoked from these relationships. And I'm particularly interested, you talk about real sisters in Shanghai Girls, Pearl and May, and then Snowflower and a Secret Fan, these are Lao Tong. So these mm -hmm. are like old sames. These are, are girls that were paired at the beginning because they were meant to be almost like soulmates. They're so close, they're practically. Um, so is do you find that almost sisters, friendships like that, and then actual sisters, blood related, however you want to. Do you find that there's a, a difference in terms of the way? Well, there is. Yeah. And actually this, and it's, I'm so glad you brought this up because when I was writing Shanghai Girls, you know, I, I knew what was going to happen in the book. And there is a terrible betrayal that happens, but or is perceived as a terrible betrayal between Pearl and May. And the closer I got to it, the more I kept thinking to myself, is there anything one of my sisters could do that would cause an irrevocable break? And this has really troubled me. You know? And, I, and I, just, I just kept thinking, no, there really isn't. So I do, I think I mentioned this in the green room, I, I talked to a lot of book clubs in the past. It was on Skype, then it, or originally on speakerphone, then on Skype, and of course now on Zoom. But back then I think it, I was, it was still speakerphone. And when I'd get to the end of, you know, talking to the book club, I'd ask, you know, is there any, if you have a sister, is there anything she could do that would cause an irrevocable break? And always I got the exact same answer. Yes, because she slept with my husband. But then a couple of days later, I would get emails and, you know, I have a website. People can write to me through the website mm -hmm. and I would get emails and they always started the same way. I didn't want to say anything in front of my book club, but let me tell you what my sister did. Believe me, sleeping with your husband, that's the least of it. I mean, I could not believe what sisters have done to each other. And then these, these emails would always end, you know, more or less the same way. And as a result, I haven't spoken to my sister in two years, five years, 10 years. Finally, I had a, a woman say 40 years she hadn't spoken to her sister. Right. And I wrote her back right away. And I said, 40 years, you know, you must not feel like she's your sister anymore. And she wrote back and said, well, of course she is, because sisters are for life. And that is the real difference between sisters and best friends, you know, and friends that, yeah. that a sister, you know, you may not speak to her, but it is for life. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because I have two sisters, um, I'm in the middle child. And I think the reason why we're really close, A, is that we have a lot of blackmail material on all of us. So if one <laughs> were to say something, it will be quickly rebutted by other. So that way we have a nice equilibrium. 
we're always very much at peace when we're together. So it's really great. Um, well, uh, and the other thing can I just say about siblings is this is typically the longest relationship that we'll have in our lifetime. Um, and I actually, I wrote this to Catherine yesterday uh, that now there's only one other person in the world who has known me longer and that's my father. So, you know, there will come a point when she will be the person who will have known me the longest in my life. And that is typical for most of us, you know, that our parents die, we hope, you know, hopefully outlive our children, uh, that this, and then you don't meet your, your significant other until pretty far along in life. So it's usually your siblings that, that will know you the longest. And right. like you said, they know everything about you. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but they also, they know how to hurt you, but they also know how to love you best. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's really great. Um, there's another aspect of what one can expect from reading your books, and that is um, pretty vivid and visceral uh, depictions and descriptions of historical events. Um, some of them are really heart-wrenching, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, the foot binding uh, scene in Snowflower with a Secret Fan, which is just, you know, it's, it's almost difficult to read. Um, and I'm also thinking about um, the tea girl from Hummingbird Lane. What happens to those newborn twins that were born to the Aka couple? And um, I'm thinking- And then in, in Island of Sea Women, certainly the 4-3 incident, the massacre there. Absolutely. So here are these extremely detailed very, very well written, extremely detailed um, depictions of some pretty horrible things. Um, and as a writer, you are making choices. Um, do you have to reconcile having to write these very difficult passages, thinking about your reader's reaction, and then also perhaps even maybe losing some readers thinking, oh my goodness, I cannot go on. It's too heart-wrenching. It's too difficult. And then they're, you know, well, so so each of those three examples, it was very different with, with Snowflower and the Secret Fan. You know, this is a, a, what had inspired me was um, there's this very remote county in China in um, southwestern Hun, uh, Hunan province mm -hmm. where the women there had invented a secret code writing system that they invented, used, and kept a secret for a thousand years. And part of why they did that was first, they were bound footed, they couldn't get out. And the other was that they were illiterate in men's writing. And in my mind, I just felt like, well, okay, I, I can deal with the illiteracy part, they're just not taught, but you have to understand really why these women couldn't get out. And so I actually didn't think that much about the foot binding. It was to me, as I was writing it, it was just like, I have to have this down before I can get to the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I may have been cavalier, actually, in how I wrote it, and because I wasn't thinking of it as, oh, this is the showstopper. And, and people will often say to me, oh, that scene, you know, I'll never forget. It's, you know, and it's, it is one of the, I guess, of everything I've written, one of the things that's most memorable. It's only four pages. Yeah. And yet it's, you know, it comes up again and again. Um, so that was that one. Mm -hmm. With um, the island of, uh, sorry, Tea Girl, you know, the, the, what happens to the twins is just right in the end of the first chapter, mm -hmm. I think. Straight and up. That's Straight a, up. you know, a, and, and with the foot binding, it's that the, you know, in the second chapter, in the first chapter is very, very short. So, you know, these both, both of these things happen on around page 25. And I, by the time I wrote Tea Girl, I was much more aware of the fact of, or thinking more about readers like, oh, they're going to want to put this down and not pick it up again. And I did think about that, but I also, it was so important for Leanne, it, it, it changes her path. It's the thing that sets her journey in motion. And it's also something that has a ripple effect. You know, I really feel that's important that if you have something, how do I say this? You know, we watch a lot of, right, Law and Order, or we're now watching, what is it called? Something like Paris Crime. I, I think it has a different 
name in English uh, than what it was there, but it's, you know, at the end of every episode, so the, the crime is solved. And you never really see the ripple effects of these terrible things that happen in people's lives. And yet we know, and we're certainly right now, you know, mm-hmm. as people are, have been dying all around us, we know that this, these kinds of losses or moments of violence have a ripple effect that stay within families um, that can continue on for years and years. And so to me, that's what I'm, I'm thinking about is how did, you know, that what, what happens to the twins, it's not an isolated incident. I didn't just throw it in for the hell of it. It, right. ha- it, it changes the on, but it also changes everyone. And you don't even see some of the, understand some of those changes until, you know, 300 pages later. Um, so I, and just one last thing I'll just say about um, in Island of Sea Women, mm-hmm. that the, the fourth three incident is something that most people don't know about, you know, was eight years of, of a massacre followed by 50 years of government enforced silence. So it's not a surprise that people don't know about it. Mm-hmm. But I, I also think often in, in literature, in uh, movies and television, you know, there, there are these acts of violence. And yet again, there's like no repercussion. There's no um, ripple effect. And so I, I, I felt like I, and because that was a true event, that I really had to be true to what had happened for people to really understand the, the level of what had happened there. And so th- those are three very different kinds of things. But I'll just, the last thing I want to say about that and is sort of my approach to those is when I wrote Snowflower and the Secret Plan and I turned I sent it to my agent first and she always has like five young women who work for her who are learning to be agents. And she has all of them read the manuscript and then they all send, you know, send to the writer their thoughts. Mm-hmm. And this one young woman wrote to me and said, you haven't come out against foot finding. You need to come out and tell people foot finding is a bad thing. And actually, I don't need to do that. That's not the role of the writer to to make a lecture. What I want to do is just be in the room. And if I can just be in the room with those people as they're experiencing what they're experiencing, then what I hope is that readers take that, that they're in the room too. And I don't think there's a, I mean, I can't imagine that there's a reader anywhere in the world who sat in that room with Lily in Snowflower and the Secret Fan and thought, foot lining, what a great idea. You know, nobody would come away with that thought. So it, I, I, it's really about, I guess, do you want to lecture someone or do you want somebody to come um, to experience it themselves and come to their own conclusions. Right. No, that's really well put. And certainly that was, you know, the scene that really stuck to me and stuck with me for even today, I can, you know, picture that. Um, I guess, you know, when it comes to research, um, I think most writers, some writers, I think, in research more than others. Um, I believe you're one that actually enjoys it. And for the, your latest book, uh, The Island of Sea Woman, I'm imagining you're doing a lot of research across many different things. One is the, the, the female divers um, and then the historical events um, kind of all wrapped up into this uh, incredible story. And so how is it that you approach research? Do you talk to as many people as you can um, and then dive into written material? What is your approach for researching something? So first I, have, I do have to say that the research is my absolute favorite part. I mean, I just love it. To me, it's like a big treasure hunt. I never know what I'm gonna find. And so I look on the internet to see what I can find. I, you know, you have to be careful what you find there, but there's some really fabulous stuff. Um, I live in Los Angeles, pretty close to UCLA until the pandemic. I could, you know, for fun, I would go over to one of the seven research libraries and just poke around to see what I can find. I talk to scholars and researchers and scientists, people who spent their entire professional careers focused on something. I mean, 
with Island of Sea Women, there was a woman um, I interviewed who has spent the last 40 years collecting henya, so the sea women, um, their songs. Well, you know, there's no one else in the world who knows as much as she does. So why not talk to her? Um, I read unpublished dissertations. I try to find where, you know, these strange academic journals and, you know, just, and then talking to people um, just now with the book that I'm writing about um, Tanya and Sun, the, the woman doctor, uh, there's a, a professor, you may know him down at UC Irvine, who his, you know, he's like the world's expert on Shanghai. So in a tweet last month, he sent to me like, oh, if you ever need any help with something, just let me know. And so he has now set me up with three different people around the country, who one who's an expert on travel in the Ming Dynasty, another one who's an expert on um, uh, Chinese herbal medicine. So, you know, mm -hmm. people like that, I mean, I've helped him in the past, he's helped me in the past, but that they, they can be like um, feelers out into the world. And then of course, the main thing is to go to every place that I write about, mm -hmm. And in the case of the Island of Sea Women, to actually interview those women. Wow. Um, some of those interviews, you know, were in a woman's home, two to eight hours long, sitting on the floor, drinking tea, you know, really intense, really deep, you know, really again, <laughs> intense, that's yeah. all I can say. And then also going to where the women were going into the sea in the morning, coming out in the afternoon. Uh, kind of just grabbing them, say, oh, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And sometimes they'd say, sure. And sometimes they'd be like, you know, no, I'm busy, go away. And then the third group with, with, with that book were um, the women who are semi-retired, retired, or maybe getting over an injury, who sit on the shore and sort, and gather and sort the mm -hmm. algae and seaweed that's washed ashore overnight. So you can get different things from all of that, right? So in a really short interview, it's like sometimes you get one fabulous line. Uh, there, I remember this one woman I talked to, at one, at one point she said to me, I was so good under the sea, I could cook a meal under there. I'm, I'm just like writing that down because I, I, it was fabulous, you know? And so uh, that is something that Jung Sook brags, you know, when she's bragging, she'll say that. Um, but it's also a great way to build consensus you know, in those short interviews, like, oh, one person on, on the first, one of the very first interviews I had on, on Jeju, I was, again, I'm a woman, I write about women, I don't shy away from our biology. So I'll ask things like, you know, what happened when you first got your period? How do you take care of yourself when you're pregnant? Are there things you're allowed to eat, not allowed to eat? What yeah. are the traditions around childbirth? Anyway, I, I had asked her, how long did you dive um, when, you were, when you were pregnant? And these women, they go down as deep as 60 feet on a single breath. Yeah. They stand, and that's deep enough. They have to no oxygen. Them. They're not. No they're, oxygen. They're they stay underwater two to four yeah. minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the idea that you'd be like eight, nine months pregnant, I just couldn't somehow imagine it. And she just oh, I loved being in the water when I was really, you know, like eight, nine months pregnant. She'd had nine children. Oh. And you know, I loved it because it just gave me such buoyancy. It took all the weight off my body. Well, I remembered that when I was pregnant, you know, like just it was so nice to kind of float around in a pool or in the ocean, just took that weight off. But then she added, but what I loved most of all was when I was doing itinerant work in Vladivostok in winter and I was really pregnant because, and this is water, by the way, that's so cold that the only thing that keeps it from freezing is the level of salt in the water. So, you know, really, and they're just wearing like a little cotton homemade suit. Right. So uh, she said, oh, so, you know, I just love being in that cold water when I was eight, nine months pregnant because not only did it take, you know, give me some buoyancy, but it took away, that cold water took away all my aches and pains. And I heard that and I just remember, I mean, this was like day two of when I was there and just thinking, I think that woman's fooling with me. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, that'd be true. And then I kept, so I would ask all these other women, like, oh, you know, 
did you ever do itinerant work? Were you ever pregnant? Did you, you know, were you in the water and bought a boss stock and went, you know, and, and, and then over and over again, they're like, oh, I just love that freezing cold water. And I was really pregnant. So, you know, it's a, again, a way, again, a way of gathering consensus in those short interviews, which are, you know, very different from the really in-depth long ones. Yeah. yeah. So you can see it's a, it's a big, range and just one last thing i do think of it like a treasure hunt like i said and and i never know when i'm going to find something that's just going to completely change the story so i can remember once at ucla this was when i was doing work for um peony and love and i was researching like this very narrow topic you know um that had to do with death rituals in the yangtze delta during the ming Qing transition you know, but somebody wrote about it. And I'm sitting in one of the little carols and I'm turning the pages and reading this book. And I came across ghost marriages and how they worked at that time. And I just was like, oh, I gotta have one of these. And the thing is, is that ghost marriage, it wasn't just something I threw in that actually became um, sort of the plot for the whole novel, really sort of centered around ghost marriages and ghost brides. And then with island of sea women again just you know sitting here doing, reading something and and learning that one of the uh, main ways that the divers would die in the past but all the way to, to, to today is in harvesting abalone and i just i mean I really remember it's like death by abalone <laughs> can i have that and so for me it's the right you know where is that going to go is it at the beginning is it at the middle is it at the end why is it there what's the ripple effect what's the emotional effect so um you know all that the research is the stuff that that helps me um to, to build a plot often but also if there's just stuff out there in the world you just think wow you know who knew death by Avalon. Um, no, that's that's a really great line right there. Um, I think uh, I'm seeing uh, that there are some questions in the chat, and I think maybe Alice um, from the library might might want to field some of those, and and so Lisa, you can get a chance to answer some of the questions. From sure. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Alice again. Uh, anyone who arrived late, I'm the library's new um, programs manager. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I will, in fact, be reading um, questions that we're receiving in the chat. So if you haven't written a question, now is your time. We have um, 50 minutes left. Before we move to the chat questions, Lisa, I just have my own question um, for you, which I was really struck by your kind of comment um, and question, how, how would Anna Karenina be different if it had been written by a woman? And this is a, and, and you know, kind of reflecting on the very male, and we can also say very white um, Western canon. And there has been a kind of recent trend, it seems, in um, kind of contemporary literature of female writers reclaiming male narratives. I'm thinking of Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet, I'm thinking of Madeline Miller's Circe. And I was just wondering for you, Lisa, is there, um, a male narrative that uh, maybe one day you'd want to kind of rewrite in, in a female voice? I don't think so. I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I'm not gonna say never, but I, I feel like there's so many women's stories um, to be told mm. that haven't been told. And, you know, I have been interested in stories about women that have been lost, forgotten, sometimes deliberately covered up. And there's so many of them. Mm. You know, and, and it's like, you know, can stumble on that on page 19 of an academic book on childbirth practices in the Ming Dynasty. I mean, it, you know, and then it's like, wow, here's this incredible woman who was doing something, you know, 410 years, 510 years ago. Yeah. And I just, I, and I just, sometimes I just think, how could I not have known about her? Mm -hmm. And how, how did we all not know about her? So that that's kind of what in, I, I at least for now that's um, more inspiring than revisiting a, a male character real or imagined. I mean I I guess I could do it, but I I mean it's not something that's 
really in the forefront of my interest. Okay, that was totally, totally just out of curiosity. And actually, Circe is really about Circe, wouldn't you say? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and rightly so. Because she's telling that story from a different perspective, but it's still more about her, I think. Right, 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 right. Um, we have a question about language and different kind of languages. Um, Malcolm wonders, um, do you speak fluent Mandarin um, in order to interview, you know, the people who um, you are interviewing? And I suppose I would add to that, you know, where is there a kind of loss in translation um, in, for some of your stories? And, and how do you... Yeah. So those are sort of two questions. So I'm going to, if I forget okay. the second part, remind me. So yeah. um, I, my family spoke the Seyep dialect. This is one of 1,200 dialects from Guangdong province. Um, I, when I was a kid, I, I actually could understand quite a bit. Now it's just food, <laughs> always down for food. I did study Mandarin for about four years and I think I got pretty good. I mean, there was one research trip to China. I, did, I didn't need any help, but the minute I stopped studying, it went right out of my head. So, um, but typically, uh, you know, I try to hire people who speak that local dialect. For, so for Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I um, had someone who spoke um, the, the Hunan, Hunan dialect. But once I got there, um, this was, China was still quite closed at that time. I was only the second foreigner ever to go there. Um, actually, by my count, I was the fifth, but only the second white foreigner to go there. And so I had to have with me um, someone who I guess you could think of as like a vice mayor kind of person. And so it was a great thing we had him with us because we were walking from village to village. These were a half a mile, a mile apart. And the, the dialect would change in just that short di distance, a 10, 20 minute walk. And so I don't know if you know this, but the written language of um, Chinese is standard. You know, it doesn't matter if it's um, Mandarin or Cantonese or the Wu dialect of um, Shanghai, the written language is standard. And so people will write on their palms, oh, do you mean this character or this character? And, you know, China is, has been undergoing the greatest human migration in the history of the world as, as people leave villages and go to big cities. And so they may not speak that, you know, whatever the language is, let's say, in, well, we'll just say, you know, they may not speak the Mandarin um, as it's spoken in Beijing. And so if you go to the farmer's market, you could say, I want to buy a carrot and just write it on your palm. So, so that happens. And then um, with uh, Island of Sea Women, I had four different um, people who helped me with translation. One I think of as being kind of like the official translator. She was with me when I interviewed the grand shaman, the top woman shaman on the island, uh, the governor of the province, some of the scientists. Then there was um, a young woman who was a student at the university and she was with me when I was doing those short interviews on the beach and those were fantastic. And because, you know, I, I never hire anyone who's like a professional translator um, you know, not, not someone who could work at the UN. <laughs> I, I like the more colloquial translation, but also how um, people bring their own experience to how they translate. And so how this young woman, who was, I'm going to say 20, how she would approach these old women divers, you know, at, so respectfully, but also very shy. So again, like I said, I don't, I, I I guess you could say I'm rude in the kinds of questions I ask, you know, and I would say like, oh, you know, what was her wedding night like? And this girl would be like, I can't, I can't ask that grandmother that. And then I said, oh, come on, just try, just try. But then when she did, then these women, they just wanted to help her, you know? So it was so sweet. There, and this really sweet thing happened over and over again, which was, it's, and I won't say it was every single time, but we'll say eight out of 10 times with these women on the beach, there would come a moment where the woman would say, oh, could you hold your cell phone next to my ear to this girl? No, could you hold your cell phone next to my ear? I need to call my 
son, my grandson, my nephew, you're so pretty and he's looking for a wife. And so I, you know, have photos of that on my website, but that's also in the opening scene of the novel of how um, this old woman sitting on the beach, how she gets out of this, you know, this, this awkward situation. She asks Claire, can you hold your cell phone by my ear? And then, um, and then there was a, another woman, a PhD in English. She was the first girl in her family to be educated. Um, and she, you know, PhD in English, she actually wrote her dissertation on Ezra Pound. And she took me to meet her mother, who uh, was a diver, but also um, the daughter of Japanese collaborators. And this was one of those really long eight hour interviews where, you know, I have to take into consideration that, you know, this woman was, these women, some of them were in their 90s, still diving, but in their 90s. And so after a couple of hours, I was like, oh, do you want to take a break? Oh, no, she just talked, 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 talked. You sure you don't want to take a break? I can come back tomorrow. At the end of eight hours, she was fine. You know, she had just, she was like ready for another eight. But I was tired, this, the daughter was tired. She'd gotten kind of pale, a little shaky. And I asked her, are you okay? And she said, well, you know, I, I learned more about my mother today than I've known in my entire life. And so just how powerful sometimes this can be. Now, what was the second part of your question? I forgot. Oh no. I knew I, I would. I, I, I didn't get even that. I mean, that was. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we have time really quickly for just one more. Okay, so, I'll answer. I'm sorry, I took no, too long in my answers. No, 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 no. These, these are the answers that we're looking for, and these are, you know, it's just, it's just wonderful to hear you speak about your research kind of experience, and it seems like your, you know, your researching is at once it's historical, and you're looking at files and 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 imagine books and photographs and all of these things, but also how even the process of researching itself finds its way into your into your literature by way of your beautiful translators, I imagine. <laughs> um, so this is actually a question about research and you had mentioned in your conversation, Pauline, that you love researching and that's your favorite part. And so EJ wants to know, um, how do you know when you've done enough research and, and back Never, you can never do too much. <laughs> and there are times when I think oh, I've done everything. I mean, I'm completely done. Mm. Um, a good example was in China Dolls. So uh, this is a, again, sort of based on a true time period in the 1930s uh, here in this country, there were these Chinese American nightclubs where Asian American performers could perform and they could travel nightclub to nightclub. It was you know, like going out on the Borscht Belt or um, the Chitlin Circuit. This was called the Chatsui Circuit. So the, in the opening chapter, these two girls go for an audition and, and I thought, I've done all the research, everything is done. And they've gone to this audition and they go into the bathroom and change out of their street clothes and, and they're gonna put on their little homemade tap outfits. And all of a sudden I just had this thought of, hmm, I wonder what they're wearing under there. Because they didn't have panties like we have panties today, the bra had barely been invented, you know, before that it was all corsets and, you know, different types of corseting. Um, but, you know, and people were just starting to make homemade bras. Maybe in France, they were a little ahead, right? Because it's the Brazier. But um, it, in 1937, barely, barely here. And so all of a sudden, I just went right off, <laughs> right off the deep end into doing research about the history of women's undergarments. And I spent about 40 hours on that, um, of, of which, you know, not a lot of it made into the book, but I did learn a lot <laughs> about women's undergarments. Great. Well, I hope, I hope that answers your question, EJ. <laughs> um, so we're actually coming, this event has flown by. Um, I don't know if that was anyone else's experience. Um, Lisa, thank you so much. For thank being you for having me. And thank you, Pauline. There you are. Thank you, Pauline, so thank much. Thank you, for Pauline, for your wonderful questions. Um, it's a pleasure to have you back at the library. And uh, please. And can I just, before we say goodbye, I just want to have a, I saw Charlie Trueheart's name over there. So just a special shout out to Charlie. Mm. 
Special shout out to Tolly and a special shout out to all of our sisters and mothers and daughters who can't be with us. I know certainly uh, this conversation has made me really miss my sister and the first thing I'm gonna do is call my sister when I get off. Um, so we have come to the end of our, our time. Um, Pauline has kindly offered to send um, one uh, random audience member a copy of uh, Lisa's book, The Island of Sea Women. So we will be um, selecting um, that member um, of the audience uh, tonight and letting you know. So thank you, Pauline. Um, it's been such a pleasure to host both of you, Lisa and Pauline, this evening. Um, thank you to our audience for being here, for your engagement, for your wonderful questions. Thank you for coming back week in, week out. I'm very looking forward to meeting all of you. Um, and so I hope to see you again soon, another author program. To do that, you can visit our homepage and browse our upcoming events. Just a quick reminder that importantly, the library is an independent nonprofit organization and we welcome donations at around 10 euros per person per event. Please, please use the link in the chat that Gabby has just posted um, or you can find the link in the email that you received today. We really, really appreciate your support. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight. I hope to see you again very soon. And until then, we will be, to finish the event, we'll be playing a short video um, sponsored by Grow at Annenberg, which is our sponsor for tonight. Uh, the video is about the history of our library. Thank you so much and see you soon. Great.